special you are. Each one of you, extremely special. Uh, that if it hadn't been for the Lord who's on your side, where would you be? Extremely special. And because you are so special to God and God has invested so much in you to keep you, uh, that's why I preach and I teach hard. And I've learned to preach and teach hard even if there's one person in the sanctuary. I preach and I teach hard. I even took it this far. I remember one time about 30 years ago, there was no one in the sanctuary. So Shamika, I preached and I taught. It still went forth. I didn't see any angels, didn't feel anything. I just know the word of the Lord went forth. And the Bible makes me to know that God sent forth his word and it healed them. Because God said, my word will not return back unto me void, but it will accomplish all that I set it out to do. So right now I am coming against the power of the enemy that has been trying to make somebody in here, call it someone that's literally in this place right now, as well as those that may be uh, listening on the radio or those that may be joining us on YouTube or Facebook, I'm, I'm coming against the enemy right now. I'm here to tell you that you are special. You are special. Things have conspired to work against you, work against your mind uh, to make you feel less than, make you feel small. But you are special. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I will not be here long. But I've got to give you what thus saith the Lord. Please turn in your Bibles to two scriptures. The first one is 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. The second one is Galatians chapter 6. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and Galatians chapter 6. Both are the New Testament. The first scripture is 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 3 verse 13 it reads as such but ye brethren be not weary in well doing uh, if I had to give a title to this message today it would be to all of those that are listening to me whether you're listening uh, by radio or listening by Facebook or YouTube or or whether you are here in person. I need to talk to you for a second, and I'm encouraging you, be not weary in your well-doing. Second scripture is Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Hallelujah. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, and it reads, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Before I read verse 10, let me tell you something about that. He's telling you, uh, don't stop doing the good stuff. Don't stop doing it. Whether it is praying or, or fasting or thinking good thoughts and doing good things. Don't stop doing. It may not seem as if anyone sees what you're doing, but I'm here to tell you God sees it. And he identifies uh, that he will reward us for our well-doing. It says here that we shall reap, but it qualifies that if we faint not. Uh, so before I read a verse number 10, uh, please thank you, Lord, for the blessing 
of these people that are here right now. Look at someone around you, touch someone around you, whatever. Uh, please encourage them just for a second. Tell them to hang on in there. If that's the best they can do, just hang on in there. If that's the best that you can do, just hang on in there. If you can't do any more, just hang on in there. Hallelujah. But those that can do better than hanging on in there, I'm here to tell you, keep pressing, keep pushing. Because God has a reward for you. Verse number 10, it says, in that same vein, as we have therefore opportunity, let us, oh hallelujah, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Uh, I need to focus in on that, doing good unto all men. But notice this latter clause, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. It doesn't say to them that treat you good all the time, to them that understand you all the time, to them that always got a smile on their face. You know, uh, there are some people you just love to be around because they make you feel good. Uh, even in the church, there are some people that you get around and whatever is going on in their life, they sort of pull you down. Uh, hallelujah. But even in spite of the fact that they may pull you down, you lift them up. Especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Oh, let me go on. Uh, those two scriptures uh, together conspire. They work together to tell us to do some things. It tells us to work in the church. Uh, uh, we have work that needs to be done. Just give me a few minutes so I can go through the work that needs to be done in the church. Uh, first thing, you join the work of the church through prayer. If the only involvement we have in prayer is the hour or so that we have each Sunday in church, that's not joining the work of the church. That's neglecting the work. Uh, we have to commit ourselves to expanding our regular daily prayer life, uh, giving time to prayer, giving time to seeking God's face, giving time to being in his presence. You know, something happens when you get in the presence of God. Something happens when you just get in his presence. Uh, when you're out of his presence, uh, hallelujah, let me explain that. Because God is everywhere, we know that. The psalmist at one point said, whither can I go where your spirit is not? Even if I make my bed in hell, you are there. Uh, so when we dig into this, what he's talking about is this. There are times when we just don't acknowledge the presence of God, but God wants me to tell you that he's always here. Whether you feel him or not, whether you see him move or not, God is saying, I am always here. I see everything, I feel everything, I, I hear everything that you go through. Glory to God. And so since he's here, our prayer life is not trying to get God to show up. Oh, Sister Pamela, our prayer life is not trying to get God to show up. God is saying, I'm always here. So what's prayer life? Your prayer life now is, I'm acknowledging the presence of God. And I'm talking to God. Uh, did you know that you can have a conversation with God? You can talk to God and God will talk right back to you. Hallelujah. I know that sometimes it's good just to talk. Uh, you just need to vent. Uh, you need to, to share some stuff with him, whether you had a good day or a bad day. You just need to 
share some stuff with him. Some things you got to get off your back, get off of your mind, share some things. Likewise, God wants to share some things with you. God wants to remind you that you belong to him and he belongs to you. God wants to remind you that whatever you're going through, God is saying, I'm right here. Uh, whether you are looking at the amazing daisy, uh, or whether you're looking at the amazing mountain, uh, or whether you're looking at the beautiful rose, uh, or whether you're looking at an accident that happened on the highway, God is trying to tell you that I'm here and I care what you're going through. I, I care what your day, oh hallelujah. I care what your day is all about. If you don't pray at all, then start praying. You can begin by praying for at least five minutes a day. Just five minutes. See, one minute is 60 seconds. Hallelujah. Five minutes is 60 seconds times five. Just five. Even if you have to break it up throughout the day. I prayed one minute when I got up this morning. I prayed one minute before breakfast. That's two. I prayed one minute before lunch. That's three. I prayed one minute before dinner. That's four. And before I went to bed, I made sure to put my hands together and pray. To some people, it may seem a small thing. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray you, Lord, my soul to take. Just five minutes. Just five minutes, start praying. And after you get beyond the five minutes, you can build it up to, to 15 minutes. Hallelujah. Make 15 minutes, make 13 minutes your new goal for prayer. Hallelujah. Second, join the work of the church through your giving. I noticed that some of you are beginning to catch it. We're not tipping God. Hallelujah. Oh, oh, can, 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 let me express to you what tipping God is like. Okay. It used to be in the old days that only guys went to strip bars. But now ladies go to strip bars too. Not just to see men. They just go. And they hang out. And if the show is real good, they say, make it rain. So they reach in their pocket and they start throwing the dollars around. Uh, so if God has been good, we're going to make it rain? Oh, come on. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. You can't tip God like you want a stripper. You can't tip God like he's a good cook and he prepared a good meal for you. Our giving now has got to raise up. It's got to go to another level. We give on the basis of our faith. Remember what faith is? Faith is comprised of two things. The word of God is the first ingredient. I trust in the Lord is our second ingredient. Hallelujah. So now when I'm giving, I'm saying, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I'm standing on your word. Lord, I came to you yesterday with a problem, and I asked you to take care of it. So today, Lord, when I'm coming to you, I'm not asking you to take care of it. But I'm coming to you in prayer, and I'm saying, thank you. I may not have seen the manifestation of it yet, but I, I'm saying, thank you. 
because I trust that you're moving. I trust that you heard me. I trust that you're moving. Heaven and hell to step into my reality and call those things that be not. Oh, I shot just as though they are. I trust you. 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 We can't only give to special pet projects. We've got to give. That shows our worship. Notice giving. I didn't say give how much. I said give. Give. God knows. There's sometimes, because of whatever you're going through, you may only afford to give the widow's might. Oh, hallelujah. But that one-tenth of one penny can be more than a thousand dollars that someone else gives grudgingly. Uh, so when we come with that little bit, God has a way of touching the little bit and expanding it to take care of much. Well, let me keep on going. Uh, thirdly, we join the work of a church through serving. Through serving. Let me get real specific here. Uh, you may be born again. You may have only just been conceived. It doesn't matter. God has worked it out in such a way that all of us have a spiritual gift. Everybody in here has some type of gift. Hallelujah. Uh, technically, the gifts that you received at your natural birth were to edify the world. Uh, somehow the devil got involved in some of those gifts and have perverted it. Oh, glory to God. So that the music that was supposed to edify us uh, that same music no longer edifies us, but it spurs us to perversity. Huh. Hallelujah. So I'm trying to encourage whoever is listening to me. You may not be born again, uh, uh, but you were born with a purpose. God gave you a gift at your birth. And your gift is designed by God himself to edify. Even at your new birth, God has given you a gift. So whether you have been born again or not, you are without excuse. Because all the gifts, God said, I don't, I'm not backing up off of anything. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. I bless you. I bless you. I bless you. So you can be a blessing. Then the word goes on to tell us, this is your reasonable service. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, uh, the peanut man would not have been a blessing to God if he didn't drill down in and do all that he could to give what he had for his God. You may be a dancer. Drill down in and dance for your God. You may be a drummer. Then drum like the drummer boy. Pum, pa, pum, pum. Drum for your God. You may be a stepper. Step for your God. You may be a movie maker. Make movies for your God. You may be a poet. The poet laureate for your God. You join the work of the church through your serving. Whether you're opening doors or painting walls, whether you're stacking chairs or you're visiting the, the aging or the disabled uh, at home or at the hospital or at hospice. 
from teaching preschoolers to playing an instrument in church. Oh, I know we don't have drums here, but we have uh, two organs right here. Someone knows how to play the organ? Play the organ. Hallelujah. We got what they call tambourines. Beat the tambourine. Oh, Bishop, I can't play the organ. Uh, my beat is not so good on the tambourine. But I shown up know how to clap my hands. Uh, clap your hands, oh ye gates. Oh, hallelujah. You don't get me started. Be a worshiper. Uh, be a greeter. If you don't have, if you don't think you have anything to contribute to your church's ministry, it's only because you haven't asked. If you're doing nothing in your church, make a change. Get involved. Please look in your Bibles with me to St. John chapter 13. Verse number 35, this is critical. St. John uh, chapter 13. And verse number 35. And before we read, I want to help you on something. This Bible we have is known as the good book, okay? It is so powerful, it doesn't even have a name to it. It's just called the book. <laughs> just the book, that's all about me, the book. Oh, hallelujah. The book is not talking about one of John Wayne's books or John Grisham's books or, or whoever it is, the books. Uh, when you hear about the Bible, you know what book we're talking about. The book! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The book. The book. This book. Guess what? You ready? It wasn't written to the world. The world can get something out of it. And indeed, the world does get something out of it. This book is being quoted daily uh, by imams in the Muslim faith. It's quoted by Buddhists. It's quoted by uh, Jewish uh, people. It's quoted by people all over the world. The book! But technically, this book is written to you, for you the household of God. We don't have time to do it, uh, but just for you to check it out, go to any book of the New Testament. Uh, go to the first chapter and the first few verses, and you will see how it's written from either Paul or John or Timothy, or whatever, onto the church or unto the believers, or unto the saints, that means you. Now with that said, with that concept in mind, uh, that puts a whole nother paradigm in place. Uh-oh, did you know that sometimes people in your family can get on your nerves? Can I say that again? Sometimes <laughs> people in your own family can get on your nerves. People in your own family can give you headaches. People in your own family, when you see them coming, sometimes really what you want to do is stop and go the other direction and hope that they didn't notice you. Oh, glory to God. You know I'm telling the truth. You know I'm telling the truth. <laughs> Oh, but God is saying something else. Uh, we went to, what was that? Uh, St. John 
chapter 13, verse 35, it says this. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, comma, if ye have love one to another. Oh, someone knows where I'm going with this. Uh, this is not the eros love. Uh, this is not the phileo love. This is the agape love. Uh, uh, since someone wants to play games and, and try to make you think you can't grasp it, no, 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 let me help you. Agape is, in its most basic sense, commitment. Commitment. Look at someone next to you and say, I'm committed to you. Or oh, whether you make me feel good or not, my commitment is not on the basis of how you make me feel. My commitment is on the basis of what God told me to do. It's on the basis of what God put in me to do. And because of this commitment that we have to each other, the scriptures identifying this is how the whole world would know that you are one of my followers, that you're acting like I act. You know, God was committed to us even though we assassinated him. God was committed to us even though there are times we turned our back on him. I'm not asking anyone to raise your hand. Don't testify. I'll raise my hands for you. There are times in our lives when we turned our back on God. Times in our lives when we tried to tune God out. Times in our lives when God said, go right, we purposefully went left. Oh, but God said, uh, whether you obeyed me or not, uh, I'm committed to you. Whether you like me or not, I'm committed to you. Whether you feel good or not, I'm committed to you. And he says, by this shall the world know that you are followers of me, that you're committed one to another. Let me play with this just for a second. Uh, notice in the latter clause of that scripture, it says one to another, right? Not just one for another. What's the distinction? Well, have you ever gotten something for someone and never gave it to them? You walked around with it in your pocket or in your purse or you had a Christmas gift and you never gave it to them. You had love for them, but they never got the love because you kept it in your pocket. Thank you cars that you, for whatever reason, didn't give out that were supposed to go out. Oh, you were showing love, they just didn't get it. It was for them, but they just didn't know it. Only time they know it is when your demonstration goes beyond the realm of four, F-O-R, and gets in the realm of two. They got it. They got it. They got it. Thank God that God had uh, not only love for me, but God showed his love to me. I got it. 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 The great book called Corinthians is talking to the church. I want you to look, please, at 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 and I'm starting with it as well
1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting at verse number 1. 1 Corinthians is right before 2 Corinthians. Sister Ryan, you must have heard me because all on Wednesday I kept on using that. I've been using that for the last 30 years because this lady keep on laughing at that stupid. <laughs> and it moves me <laughs> that she still likes my little stupid joke. But anyhow, uh, by the way, if you found the book of 3 Corinthians, you're in the wrong book. <laughs> 1 Corinthians, New Testament, uh, chapter 13. Now, I want you to work with me here. Uh, we know this when we read this in the King James Version. Uh, we see the word charity. Uh, that is a very powerful word. It's a, it's a deep word. Uh, but let me help you. It is actually the word love. In the Greek, this is agape. It's love, 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 love. Oh, hallelujah, I hear you, Jesus. I hear you, Jesus. Uh, let me help you on this before I read any further. In the Old Testament, there is the concept of mercy. Someone say mercy. Mercy, thank God for mercy. The concept of mercy. Uh, in the Hebrew, uh, that is Hesed, C-H-E-C-E-D, uh, -E -E Hesed. It means uh, mercy. Oh, not in the sense that we mean it. It means uh, loving kindness. In that concept of mercy is built the concept of strength and love and commitment. Hallelujah. Now, when the Greek Jews took the Hebrew scriptures and wrote the Hebrew Torah and translated it into Greek, they took the word Hesed and translated it to Elios. We know Elios today as grace. So the Hesed of the Old Testament is the grace of the New Testament. Someone say, talk about it. Uh, of the grace of the New Testament is also known as charity. It's also known as loving kindness. Uh, so when you look in the Old Testament and you read mercy, you're reading about God's grace. Uh, you're reading about God's mercy. When you read about God's grace in the New Testament, you're reading about ah, God's mercy. If it hadn't been uh, for God's mercy, where would you be? You know you're nasty. You know you're crazy. But God's mercy, God's blood had a way of covering up your mess, washing you from your mess. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. That same concept now is when we're reading this word charity. Oh, I like how some of the other translations took it a, deep, a step further. So instead of the word charity, teacher Moses says love. Love. But since we messed up love so much, we get it confused in our language. Let me extract off of the misinformation and get your focus down to the foundation. When you read charity, now read commitment. Commitment. It'll take your understanding to a whole nother level. It says in verse one, though I speak with the tongues of men, and of angels and have not commitment oh my god i am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal and though i have the gift of prophecy and i understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though i have 
all faith. I like that word faith. Remember what faith is? The word of God and you trust in it. And though I have all the word of God and all this trust in the word so that I can remove mountains and I don't have commitment, I am nothing. Verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not commitment, it profited me nothing. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Commitment, Sister Moats, suffers long. They got on my nerves, but that's okay. I'm committed. They talked about me. That's okay. I'm committed to you. You stole from me. That's okay. I'm committed. You're my child, but you broke into my house. You stole from me when I would have given it to you. But that's okay. I'm committed. God is trying to tell you something. I'm committed to you. I'm committed to you. I'm committed to you. Oh, I can tell you this is moving somebody. I'm committed to you. God is saying I'm committed to you. A Joan, whoever I'm talking to. Bobby, whoever I'm talking to. Richard, whoever I'm talking to. God is telling me to tell you he's committed to you. He's committed to your ministry. He's committed to your life. Don't matter how many times you messed up. He's committed. It don't matter. He's committed. You may have said, oops, I did it again. I can't think of whoever wrote that song. Oops, I did it again. 70 times 7. Oops, I did it again. God says, don't matter. I'm committed because I'm God. Can I take it a step further? God is saying, do you really think I'm going to let your mess up make my sacrifice of non-effect? I died for you. Not only did I die for you, watch this, watch this. Now I'm going to show you something. I'm going to tell you something. And God is saying, I literally shook up the universe. Uh, the part that you can see and the part that you can't see. There's a whole thing out there called antimatter. I shook up the whole realm of existence. When did you do it? Thank you for asking. Not only when I died and I went to another dimension called hell, I walked around in hell and I preached and I taught and I saw the captives in hell, but I did something else. I looked at hell. I looked at the grave and I said, you not strong enough to hold me down. You not strong enough to keep me, do you really think your addiction can keep God down? Oh my God. Then the scripture tells us he came up out of hell. He told them sisters around, don't touch me. See, now my brain is high priest. Don't, don't touch me, because I got to carry my blood. We just talked about it. To the mercy seat that's in heaven. So don't touch me. But you can see that he who was once dead is now alive. Hallelujah. Let me go on. I got, someone needed to hear that. Let me keep on, let me keep on going, let me keep on, let me keep on going. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Please go in your Bible to so 1 John uh, chapter 4. 
Now note this as you're turning to that. First Corinthians uh, chapter 13 that we were just reading. Mother Williams, it's written to the church. Sister Ryan, it's, wit it's written to the church because the church, we have a way of killing each other. Either through what we do or what we don't do. One reason we come together is that there's a song we used to sing, uh, I love you, you love me, we are all a part of God's body, I need, oh hallelujah, that you have what I need and I have what you need. I like what the Archbishop Dwayne Brock was saying is that what you represent, Sister Moats, you ready for this? You represent an answer to somebody's problem. God allowed you to go through some things because he could trust that you would go through it and come out on the other side and then you're going through it. He deposited some stuff into you. Oh, oh, thank you for asking what did he deposit. He deposited into you the answers that the sister next to you need to have. He gave you the message to mess with his mess. Sister Ryan, you aren't strong enough to get up out of that. God says, I'm strengthening you. I allowed you, hallelujah, because you are the answer to somebody else's mess. Sister Shamika, I protected you. I kept you. I built hedges around your mind so you would not go insane. Why? Because your ministry is too important. I gave you the answer that somebody else it needs. Why didn't that divorce kill you? Because God kept you to elevate your ministry to a whole nother level. Oh, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. First, first John, first John, not second John, first John chapter four, uh, starting at verse one, it says, beloved, hallelujah, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Verse 2, hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Verse 3, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Verse 4, but ye are of God, little children. Notice this next clause. And have overcome them. I have that highlighted, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Overcome them. Who is the them he's talking about? He's talking about the them he identified in verse 1. The spirits that are not of God. By the way, just like the Holy Ghost, our Holy Spirit, remember David, David recognized there are many different spirits out there. That's why he said, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Holy Spirit is not his name. This is just what he does. It, it, it reflects his office. Okay? Well, there are other spirits that are out there. That's why David made a distinction. I know there are other spirits, but the thing that distinguishes your spirit from their spirit is that you are the Holy Spirit. You're the sanctified spirit. So these other spirits are not holy. They're not sanctified. 
but they have mouthpieces too. Called false prophets. False prophets don't have to be dressed up in a robe. False prophets don't have to go around trying to make you drink some crazy Kool-Aid. False prophets don't have to be dressed like that, look like that, act like that all the time. But however the false prophet, whatever he or she looks like, God is saying, you have overcome those spirits. Why? Because greater is he that's in you, that's on you, that walks with you, that talks to you, than he that's in the world. Just give me a few more minutes, please. Who are the them? Every false spirit, every negative thought, every false prophet that tried to destroy you. You know there are false prophets out there. Present, oh, you ain't never gonna make it. Have you ever been in a relationship that felt good to you, liked it, but you knew it wasn't of God? And when you left that relationship, that person said, Oh, but you're going to miss me. That is a false prophet. Trying to prophesy damnable things over you. And God is trying to get you to hear this. Greater is the Holy Ghost in you than those spirits that are in the world, than any false prophet. Well, let me go on, let me go on. You know this, Ecclesiastes uh, 9 and verse 11 in Matthew uh, 10, 22. I'm only going to read a portion of Ecclesiastes 9 and 11. It says, I returned and I saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Hallelujah. Matthew 10 and 22 says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Oh, hallelujah. Let's combine the two thoughts right there. One, an Old Testament prophecy. The second one, a New uh, Testament prophecy. It's identifying <laughs> that you may not be the fastest runner. It may, you, you may not be the strongest fighter. Oh, but in the New Testament, he finishes the thought, huh? it's he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Oh, I'm here to tell you, you can make it, you can make it, you can make it, you can make it. Oh, you can make it, you can make it. Uh, you don't have to be like anybody else. Uh, you may not jump as high. You may not know as much scripture. You may not run as fast. Uh, they may pass you up uh, and look at you as they're running past you and give you that look. Uh, uh, you know what look I'm talking about. Uh, some people look at you and just look down their nose at you. Oh, you didn't dream it up. Uh, you just uh, felt it. Uh, uh, your job uh, is not to be moved uh, by how they look. Uh, just tell them uh, in the way you act. Uh, tell them in your worship uh, that you're running for your life. Uh, when you see me clapping, I'm running for my life. Uh, when you see me praying, I'm running for my life uh, because he that endures to the end shall be saved. And this is known as waiting on the Lord. Can I give you one last scripture? Uh, please go. I'm 17 minutes over. Please go to Isaiah chapter 40. Old Testament. I want you all to get this. Isaiah begins with an I. Old Testament. If you cannot find it, look in your table of contents. 
If you need a Bible with a table of contents, see us after service. We'll be sure to get you a Bible with a table of contents. But Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, those that are regular attenders here, those that follow us on Facebook, YouTube, or the radio, uh, you should already have this verse highlighted. This is one of our battle scriptures. And it reads in verse 31, but they, that means you and me, that wait upon the Lord. Oh, can I stop for a second? Uh, that word wait is kava. It means put your hand in God's hands. It means tie yourself up into God. It, not just serving him in that sense, but serving him in the sense of saying to him, I'm committed to you. I may not understand but I'm committed to you. Uh, I don't question your intent. Uh, I may question what you're doing, uh, but I don't question your intent because uh, I know you love me. I know you have the best for me. And because of that, uh, I'm homo logeo with you. I'm drawn up alongside of you and I will not be moved. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew of their strength. I like the word renew right there. Renew is made up of two words. One is re, which is short for repeat. Another one is new. When you add them together, repeat what was new. In other words, go back to your first love. Go back to how it was when you first began. Shall renew their strength. And they shall mount up with wings as eagles. And you're gonna run and not be weary. And you will walk and not faint. They're talking about you. They said some crazy things about you. Someone said it underneath their breath. Someone else said it. They whispered it loud enough so they know you can hear it. but you keep praising God. They may be laughing at you, but you keep praising God. Your wallet may be laughing at you. Has your wallet ever laughed at you? I took my wallet out once, opened it up, it was nothing in it but a laugh. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I kept praising God, regardless of what my wallet said. Why? Because I trust him. Why? Because I heard him. Why? Because someone once told me that you can't be God-giving. So even though I didn't have it, I still gave my only dime. I'm enduring to the end. They pass you up again. But keep trusting God. Keep praying to God. Keep serving God. Keep your commitment to God. Stay committed. Keep loving. Can we stand on our feet, please?
Hey guys, it's Josiah here and we just finished service. I pray that that was a blessing to you and to your family. Uh, if you want to give, you can give. Wherever you happen to be, whether you're right here on Sunday morning at 3815 Woodbine, the Grace Christian Fellowship, or whether you're driving on the expressway, uh, if you're driving and you feel the need to pray and praise, uh, be careful, pull to the side if you have to. But we can already give it to God. I heard someone say that when we stretch out our hands, it's in surrender, it's in giving up. So wherever you are, just stretch out your hands to your God. Or you may think you have it all together. Uh, but there are deeper depths. There are higher heights. And the Lord gave it to him. And God has promised to meet you at your fingertips. God has promised to meet you beyond your fingertips down to your wrist. God has promised uh, to take this down to your elbow. God has promised to cover you. I'm declaring right now that the Holy Ghost right now is covering somebody I'm talking to. Just say it with me, Lord, not just my hands, but my whole being, cover me, cover me. Cover me, cover me, cover me, cover me. Now, devil, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus. We remind you, you a defeated foe. Yeah, I'm pointing my finger to whatever devil's looking at me right now. You a defeated foe. Oh, I, 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 I may not have done it, but God did it. And then you know what he did? He gave me the victory. God whooped you, and then God gave us the victory. God beat you. Someone said he beat you with an ugly stick. No, you was already ugly. God beat you, and then he gave us the victory. That's why I said you don't have to fight in this battle. That's what he said. Well, what is what he said? That's why he said, send Judah first. Because you don't have to fight in this battle. You just go now. See what God is doing, he's connecting dots and taking it to a whole nother level. He said, now you just praise me for what I've already done. Right where we're standing right now. Thank you for joining us. You can shut us off. Right where, whoever you are right now, just begin to praise your God. 